Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ann O'Donnell. I'm from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Again, thank you all for being here. Thanks to Amy and, and uh, the group for organizing such a great conference. So my job is to briefly cover the epidemiology of bronchiectasis following on Jen's really good presentation about NTM. Um, let me just mention that I have some disclosures. This is a CME conference, so I'm involved with a number of clinical trials, and I've received some consulting fees, uh, scientific advisory boards from companies involved in uh, NTM and bronchiectasis research. So what I thought I would do is uh, kind of look at this from what I see is patients frequently a uh, ask questions about bronchiectasis. Number one, what is it? And I think we heard a question from a patient today that sort of brings out that issue that um, patients, because uh, we physicians do a bad job in explaining this about the overlap between bronchiectasis and NTM, so I'm going to get to that. Why do I have bronchiectasis? Who else has it? Um, you know, who's predisposed to it? Um, why is it increasing in prevalence? Do I have COPD? I bet if I asked people in the room if they had been diagnosed with COPD before they had bronchiectasis, um, that's a common mistake. Um, and then what's the difference or what's the overlap between bronchiectasis and NTM infection? So what is bronchiectasis? Bronchiectasis is the anatomic abnormality in your lungs that predisposes you to getting these infections. And although there's issues in terms of, um, particularly with NTM, whether NTM causes the bronchiectasis, many, most patients probably have the bronchiectasis first and then get infections like NTM and other bacteria complicating this anatomic abnormality. So it's your small airways, um, that become abnormally enlarged and thick-walled and then become a, a, a focus or a nidus for getting infected, and that's what bronchiectasis is. The classic disease is cystic fibrosis, though the patients that, um, that we're talking about today mainly do not have CF, although clearly there's probably an undiagnosed uh, CF or at least a CF genetic uh, abnormality in, in many patients. As you know, the symptoms are kind of nonspecific, uh, chronic cough, usually with sputum production, and then recurrent respiratory infections. And I love this uh, picture because uh, this is from Alan Barker's uh, publication a number of years ago. I think a picture is worth a thousand words. And you know, one lesson I would leave with the patients in the room is that you ought to you know, get this imprinted in your head and also to understand sort of what your CT scan looks like because this really helps, I think, patients to understand why we're pushing airway clearance, you know, why you're predisposed to getting infections because there's a certain part of your lung or, or all of your lung that has this uh, small airways disease. Here's a picture of what it looks like when the a part of the lung is removed. And uh, you can see a number of features in this uh, slice of lung that explain why patients cough up yellow, green sputum because the airway is plugged with that kind of uh, material. Also why you might cough up blood or have hemoptysis because when, an, uh, when a part of the lung is infected chronically, it tends to get more blood vessel formation and that's why patients cough up blood. And you can see uh, on the right-hand side there is what it looks like uh, when we take out a lobe for bronchiectasis. So this is the classic um, explanation for the disease, uh, what we consider to be a vicious cycle where um, there's infection, uh, which results in chronic inflammation, which results in uh, chronic damage to the airways, and then that vicious cycle continues. The airways are damaged, there's uh, propensity for getting infected, there's more inflammation, and the cycle just perpetuates itself. This is from uh, Peter Cole's work. Um, in terms of the prevalence of, of uh, non-CF bronchiectasis in the United States, this slide demonstrates that, and it really overlaps uh, to a great extent with what we just saw for NTM prevalence. This is a disease that does extend across the spectrum of age in the U.S. This is work from Greg Tino. Uh, a few years ago that he published, but you can see women are, um, have a higher rate of this disease in the U.S. than men, and uh, the older age group, the older you get, the more likely you have this, although clearly there's people in their teens and children, teens and uh, young adults who also have bronchiectasis. 
Um, this is some data from other parts of the world, and you know, this shows that not only in the US, but in Asia, in Europe, um, the incidence and the prevalence of the disease is increasing. Now that may be because we're better at diagnosing it or we're more uh, you know, thinking about, the physicians are thinking about this more, uh, but clearly um, a disease that once thought to be we never see it again uh, because it was thought to be only related to old tuberculosis. It's clearly resurging around the world. And again, it's probably because more patients actually do have the disease, but we're also better at diagnosing it. And I'm sure everyone in the room knows that the way we diagnose bronchiectasis is with a CT scan. It's quite simple as long as uh, the diagnosis is thought of. Um, I think clinicians are recognizing this more, but clearly, as we heard from the panel, I bet uh, most patients in the room were not diagnosed the first day they had this disease. There's often a long delay between the develop of symptom, development of symptoms and the diagnosis. And that's because cough is a common complaint that physicians see. Uh, primary care physicians in the United States are not particularly familiar with the diagnosis of bronchiectasis. Um, you know, I would, if again, if I had people raise their hands in the room, I bet you had 10 z packs before you were uh, ever diagnosed with bronchiectasis or with NTM. Um, doing sputum cultures is kind of a lost art, unless you're in the know, if you will, like people in, in, in the room here, um, because sputum cultures are just not something done very much in primary care practices in the U.S. And there's also a, a spectrum of disease here. Um, you know, from very mild, dry cough um, to very severe chronic cough, uh, daily mucus production. So that's another difficulty with our disease is that it's, it's quite heterogeneous. Uh, some patients are, you know, have very mild symptoms or really no day-to-day -day symptoms but are just a little more subject to getting respiratory infections. And then some patients, you know, are really burdened by uh, daily symptoms and frequent um, flare-ups or exacerbations. This is data from uh, the U.S. Bronchiectasis Registry, which Ken mentioned uh, earlier. We do have uh, over 2,000 patients now enrolled in this database. Uh, it does represent uh, a slice of the U.S. population, obviously, and it also, uh, the patients are enrolled in centers that are, have expertise in bronchiectasis, so that somewhat skews the population that are entered in this data. But you can see uh, nearly 80% of the patients in our registry are, are women. Uh, the median age is 64, goes along with the, the prevalence data that we've seen. Um, although Hawaii and uh, Asian Americans are at risk for this disease in our registry right now, um, somewhat because of where we're, uh, the sites are enrolling, it is pr primarily a Caucasian a thin group of patients, as we can see from around the room, uh, and most patients never smoked, so smoking is not particularly a risk factor for this disease. Many patients um, in our registry, about a quarter of patients, also have chronic nasal or sinus disease, and I'm sure um, you know many of you in the room are, have experienced that. And typically, uh, the age in, uh, diagnosis is in the late 50s, but most patients have had symptoms for at least five to 10 years before being actually diagnosed. So why, why do you have this? Um, it's you know, not clear in many cases why patients develop bronchiectasis. So probably at least right now, a quarter to a third of patients, even if we do extensive testing to find a cause, we don't identify a specific cause. Probably in about another quarter of patients, we think it's due to some old infection in the past, um, diagnosed or not diagnosed, that put them at risk. But then there are some things, and, and I think um, everyone in the room you know, has heard about CF as a, a particularly late diagnosis of CF, but immunologic deficiencies, rheumatologic diseases, uh, these congenital abnormalities, and then uh, GI aspiration uh, are potential risk factors. Um, hopefully you can see on the, the left here is a, an example of a patient who has bronchiectasis in only one part of their lung, in this case uh, in the left lower lobe. Uh, on the right hand uh, CT slice, the bronchiectasis is obviously in both lungs. And uh, for us clinicians, this um, difference in how the CT scan looks and where the disease is 
does help us to a certain extent to think about potential reasons why the patient might have this disease. So if you have bronchiectasis in only one part of your lung, there may be a focal abnormality in the, the large bronchus that leads to that area that's affected. So that can even be something like a foreign body. I've seen myself, the top of a big pen stuck in somebody's airway that caused their bronchiectasis that was never diagnosed. Um, there can be a tumor, particularly a benign tumor. Uh, I've had uh, other um, oddball airway obstructions causing focal bronchiectasis. Aspiration, people who can't, uh, who don't swallow uh, properly, patients who have had uh, radiation treatment to their neck uh, for head and neck cancer often have focal uh, bronchiectasis in their right lower lobe because it kind of directly uh, goes down there. But then there's the diffuse disease, and that can either be because you have a pulmonary disease predisposing you to this, uh, or you have uh, a congenital disorder. Many of the, um, the, the big three uh, congenital disorders, cystic fibrosis, pulmonary uh, or primary ciliary dyskinesia, to some extent alpha-1 deficiency, also is associated with sinus disease and then other systemic diseases. So when we see a patient um, uh, with bronchiectasis, and you know, I think the patients in the room need to understand this, we really sort of have to think in our heads, is there a reason for this? And should we look for certain underlying disorders which might potentially be treatable and might help their bronchiectasis? So I'm sure you know, many of the patients in the room have had immunologic testing, the basic immunoglobulin levels, They've been looked at for some of these systemic diseases, um, like allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, other autoimmune diseases. Inflammatory bowel disease is a risk factor for developing bronchiectasis. If you have focal disease, it might be worth doing a bronchoscopy to check the airway leading to the area of disease. And it probably, um, if you have symptoms, uh, and maybe not, uh, should be looked at for aspiration. Just very briefly, because you've heard about this, you know, um, we're learning a lot more thanks to um, Dr. Olivier, Dr. Jennyman, and other people looking at um, these host factors uh, for developing bronchiectasis. And obviously we have now genetic testing that we can do to, uh, to diagnose CF. And so um, looking for that in the right kind of patient, uh, particularly if the patient also has sinus disease or has uh, infertility, uh, or is infected with these certain organisms that are listed here is probably worth it. And likewise, uh, if uh, ciliary dysfunction is suspected, that usually presents uh, right away in infancy, uh, a lot of ear disease associated with it, and that's a reason to look for that possibility. You know, some patients with bronchiectasis have very little uh, disease, and obviously you have to take my word for it on this slice of the CT. There's some bronchiectasis in the, the right middle lobe. Um, patient doesn't really produce much sputum. Other patients have this kind of disease where I don't have a pointer, but it's very focal um, down in the lower part of the lung, and the patient produces a lot of sputum. And then um, some patients have cavities um, and that uh, usually is associated with a great deal of sputum production. So let me just, again, reiterate this uh, relationship between bronchiectasis and NTM disease because clearly they, you know, it's, it's great that we've now brought together um, these two diseases, particularly for uh, advocacy purposes and for drug study purposes because NTM is one type of uh, bacterial infection that patients with bronchiectasis get. Yet, it seems as though NTM may also cause bronchiectasis. So there's kind of this chicken and egg uh, phenomenon um, that you know, we don't totally understand. But a lot of patients with NTM infection also have other bacterial infections. So just because you have NTM doesn't mean you can't have a strep uh, or a staph uh, infection or infection with pseudomonas. So I think it's um, very helpful uh, as a patient to have a sense of you know, what the bacteria is that you have uh, so that it can be targeted uh, properly for treatment. Also with NTM, you'll hear more about this, uh, some patients have 
a very kind of wispy, as we call nodular disease, where the small airways are plugged up with mucus that's infected with NTM. Many of you probably heard the expression tree and bud uh, finding on CT. Uh, again, the small airways plugged with, uh, uh, with mucus. Other patients have cavitary disease, like in this right-sided uh, CT slice. Um, that's, you can see for yourself, there's a lot more destruction uh, of the lung there than there is with the, the CT on the left. So I would just emphasize, you know, the need for doing microbiology to test for all the different pathogens uh, that can be present in, in your lungs. Uh, so routine uh, bacteria, uh, the non-tuberculous mycobacteria for some patients, fungi like aspergillus uh, also are a potential problem. And um, it is somewhat specific to the area uh, in which you live, as, as we've already heard. Is there a blood test to look for or to diagnose the disease? No. Uh, is there a way uh, to tell when you have an exacerbation or a flare-up? Um, you know, it's like, I know it when I see it kind of thing. I'm sure patients feel that way, but um, we're trying to come up with definitions uh, to, to make it easier to standardize this. And finally, um, you know, do we have any markers about what's going to happen to you as a patient when you're diagnosed with this disease? And we're going to hear more about that in some of the talks later today. Uh, likewise, living better with the disease. Curing it is difficult unless there's surgery, um, unless surgery is a possibility. So I would just conclude by saying this was a, a quick overview of sort of understanding uh, who has bronchiectasis. Um, you know, to confirm the disease, it's the, the cough and sputum production, but CT scan is the way we make the diagnosis. Um, when you're talking to your physician, you know, you, get, you can't just stop at that, as we heard from the patient panel. You know, there are diseases that cause bronchiectasis that potentially can be treated, like an immunoglobulin deficiency or alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, although those are both very rare diseases. It's very important that we know the microbiology and ultimately we'll hear more about treatment. What I've learned from patients over the years, really, I think the panel uh, today really brought a lot of these points forward. Um, there's a long delay in diagnosis for many patients. You know, we're the in crowd here, I would say, but we need to get the word out um, everywhere about, especially to primary care physicians about uh, this disorder. Um, there's we don't do a very good job in explaining the disease to the patients, and we need a team approach with our respiratory care practitioners, with nutritionists, uh, sometimes psychologists can be helpful. There's a big psychosocial component to this disease, and clearly, as we've heard already, there's a big burden of treatment. One thing I learned from our conference last year, and, and actually the person sitting next to me today mentioned, you know, hearing, right? A lot of patients with this disease have impaired hearing because, not necessarily because of the disease, but because of the uh, treatments. And uh, I think we physicians don't pay enough attention to that. Um, the treatments are clearly burdensome, but the, the options are there uh, um, to, to deal with the disease. And uh, I would just close up by saying that, you know, the worldwide prevalence is increasing uh, to some extent because we're better at diagnosing it, but probably the disease itself is increasing. There are multiple causes, although we don't always uh, identify a cause. How we evaluate the patient should be tailored to the patient's uh, particular presentation, and it's very important to understand the microbiology. Uh, I think you'll get these slides, but these are uh, uh, websites that I find very helpful. Uh, the NTMIR, and you've already seen the, um, the COPD Foundation's website. And then there's the Australian Toolbox and uh, Bronchiectasis News Today. And just finally, um, in July, we're hosting at Georgetown the World Bronchiectasis Con Conference uh, number three. And there is a patient uh, session on Saturday, July 14th. You can invite your East Coast friends to attend. So thank you very much. Thank you.